Hello again. For the record, this video is the second half of the point I began making in the last video. From planned obsolescence to the plan to own nothing. Living in the 21st century at the pace we find ourselves flying around in, it's kind of hard to remove ourselves from our time and place our minds into the space of our predecessors. We've been through quite a lot at this point. Wet your hands with water. Water. Apply soap. Apply soap. Apply soap. Rub your hands palm to palm. Water. And wash the backs of both hands. Apply soap palm to palm with fingers interlocked. Clasp your hands together and rub and rub and wash. Apply soap and rub. Rub your fingertips in the palms of your hands and wash and wash water. And finish off with the wrists. And wash. Rinse your hands really well with water and dry them thoroughly with a paper towel. Water. Your hands are now clean. clean. A lot of us have seen the man behind the curtain pulling the switches. Many of us have seen him more times than we can count on both hands. The pain of that heartbreak is many, many prom nights ago. We've grown a little hardened. We have no more f to give. Today we're being told that we've irreparably harmed the planet, overextended the resources, damaged the environment. This message characterizes the era of continual crises we find ourselves in. What we aren't being told, however, is that many of the very behaviors that are claimed to be so harmful for the planet now are some of the very same that corporations worked ever so carefully in the 20th century post-war period to manipulate everybody into and to inculcate into everyone in the first place. So back once again down memory lane to the 20th century we go. Because context matters. How we got here matters. This is not a, happening in a vacuum. In the last video, I took a cursory glance at planned obsolescence. An economic model that modern humanity has been living with for over a century now in some form or another. At least that we know about. A lot of people are generally familiar with this idea, the... The idea that something is created with an artificially limited period of usefulness, of, of life, whether that be because it's designed to fail by a certain point in time, so it's given a death date, or it's designed to become unfashionable and thus gets discarded well before it ceases to actually physically function. If you can believe it or not, there was actually a time period where longevity was a point of sale for businesses. There were companies that actually did try to make the best products possible. Ones that lasted the longest and did what they were supposed to do. I know to many of you in 2023, this is a shocker. This is a crazy, it's crazy that I'm saying that. Other crazy old fashioned ideas are things like, we used to hold on to stuff, like rugs and clothes and dishes, and we would hand those down to our children and our grandchildren as heirlooms from one generation to another. Advertisers would actually stress durability as a major feature of products. Lifetime guarantees were selling points. That was a thing. Obsolescence was not always a blatant part of the engineering and manufacturing process. But sometime after World War II, a time characterized by advertising volume increasing more rapidly than gross national product, the stance on obsolescence appears to have changed, and drastically. There's an obvious shift, and with that shift, a corporate re-education program of sorts that seems to have taken place in the population, which gained considerable traction, especially throughout the 50s and into the 60s. Actually training people, from the engineers designing it, to the customers buying it, to justify, accept, and even expect obsolescence in the name of progress. So I want to go further into the specifics on how this was done. The tenets of obsolescence, if you will. And going into this, you have to remember that this period of time was characterized by television still being relatively new and a relatively new thing in homes. It's a period 
where educational programs were propagandizing people on how to be good citizens, good parents, good wives, good homemakers. And so Jack is learning about social control. Emotions. Now we all start with a primary set. And as we grow older, we acquire more of them. If you lie in bed so long that you have to rush, how can you expect to be neat and clean? However, Trixie's been around, and when it comes to undressing, she should be able to show us a thing or two. This is a story about what to do on a date. Here's something else for your appearance. Eat a hearty, balanced breakfast. Inundating people with images about what a good home looked like and what that home needed to have in order to be considered a good home. Families in most cases depend upon a paycheck for the necessities of life. Which was lots and lots and lots of new stuff and all the time. Careful there. Well, how do you like that? Bouncing tumblers. Staged in dramatic or humorous fashion, scenes like this introduce new products of all kinds to the public and strongly influence purchasing trends. So let's take a look once again at Vance Packer's 1960 book, The Wastemakers. Number one, first and foremost, everyone needs to buy twice as much stuff. To end a glut in production, instead of just producing less because people didn't actually need it, corporations began promoting the idea of turning people into gluttons in the name of modern living. Packard writes, as the marketing experts groped for ways to keep sales soaring in the face of mounting saturation, one of the first thoughts that struck them was that each consumer should be induced to buy more of each product than he had been buying. This continued to the point that corporations started literally promoting the idea that people should buy two of everything, where one was previously all that was actually needed. Double fresh. For example, you had the president of Servel, Inc., making the claim that the American standard of living called for owning two refrigerators. Look at that. Isn't it beautiful? The American Home Laundry Manufacturers Association was calling for people to own two washers and two dryers in one house. The size or design, each imperial, such as these coal pantries and ranges, merges into its individual setting with the eloquent beauty of rare jewels. It got to the point where the big three in Detroit were spreading the message that every home needed two cars, referring to what they deemed one car captivity. The essence of which was that peasants who only own one car are chained to the land like serfs in the Middle Ages, and the only way to liberation was to buy a second vehicle. Boy, here's real emancipation from old-fashioned chores. That's the kind of emancipation any woman can understand. Well, what do you think of our complete home laundry? Great for you, but what about the rest of us peasants? We don't got it. We don't happen to have anything like this at home. And this just continued. What started with a two chickens in every pot mentality in the 1920s progressed to a post-war era where home builders were pushing the second home family and that every family needed two homes to be truly fulfilled. We've looked at a couple of older houses, but that's no improvement. We've got an older house. But she's not in her private bedroom. She's renting a pod with a whole bunch of strangers. Think co-ed dorm life for adults. It's called pod share. This was quickly echoed by every other company who stood to financially benefit. You know, everyone from building material suppliers to appliance manufacturers to the companies that make carpets and drapes, all salivating together over the fact that they were going to get people to fill up two fully equipped kitchens now and buy two television sets and two sets of living room furniture for two different living rooms, etc., etc., etc. If only there was some way of really selling George on the idea. The fifth freedom, maybe. Freedom from unnecessary drudgery. Number two, a disposable life. The first trend of getting people to buy more stuff than they needed handily led to the second trend of people throwing away more stuff 
and sooner. People were being taught to embrace this new concept of disposable living. Disposable everything. TV dinners that came in single-use aluminum trays. Food that was cooked in single-use throwaway plastic bags. This spurned on things like disposable razors, disposable diapers, disposable salt shakers. Even disposable camping equipment, like sleeping bags and tents. The 50s truly heralded the disposable era. Aluminum is everywhere. In the air, on the ground, and on the sea. And a big part of the new advertising relied on selling people the convenience of just throwing stuff away instead of reusing it or washing it or dealing with it. And all of this disposable packaging, mind you, came at a much steeper price. And at some points, uh, according to Packard, the packaging actually cost customers 10 times as much as whatever product was inside of it. This is very much like Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, wherein the voices of sleep teachers adapt future demand to industrial supply by lulling citizens to sleep at night with lines like, we always throw away old clothes. Ending is better than mending. Ending, Ending is, is better, better than, than mending. mending. Ending, Ending is, is better, better than mending. Ending is 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 better than mending. Throwing stuff away became so trendy that some companies in this country were even designing their products in order to trick people into accidentally throwing away what were otherwise perfectly good items just so they could sell more of them. There's a story in this book, and I wish I was kidding, about how a company that made potato peelers knew that its product was basically indestructible. It basically lasted forever. It was almost impossible to destroy with normal use. So they sat around at a table and thought about how can we get people to buy more potato peelers and purposefully change the color of the handle so that it would be the same color as potato peels in the hopes that housewives peeling with them would accidentally throw them out with the peels and then have to buy a new one. <laughs> so they were tricking people into throwing stuff away that they would not have thrown away on their own so they would buy more of them. That's the level, okay? No, you think that's the level? I'll tell you what the level is. The level is that one company went so far in this regard as to get caught, get in trouble by the Federal Trade Commission in 1958. The Holland Furnace Company, which was once the largest seller of replacement home furnace systems in the nation, was caught sending salesmen to people's houses who pretended to be government inspectors, or sometimes they would call themselves heating engineers, or they would say they were utility inspectors working with a government fuel conservation program. But in the end, they would gain access to a person's house through illegitimate means and then dismantle their furnaces without permission and then refused to reassemble the furnace under the claim that it was dangerous and might explode. And they were going around doing this all over the place. And the FTC found that, that a lot of these furnaces were actually fine. Or if something was wrong with it, whatever it was, was easily repairable. And they didn't really need to be replaced. But the Holland Furnace Company got a lot of furnace owners to discard what were otherwise perfectly good furnace systems under the belief that they were dangerous and might blow up. That's the level. So they got people to throw away whole furnace systems so they could replace them with new ones. By 1961, this company was barred from doing business in the state of Minnesota, which was the first time an out-of-state company had been ordered out of Minnesota in 50 years at that point. And Holland Furnace Company went out of business altogether not too many years after that. I think it was in 66. But that's the level, okay? The third tenet of obsolescence was to make stuff that sucks. So in the last video, I talked about the light bulb conspiracy, the purposeful shortening of how long light bulbs lasted in order to make more money selling them more often. But that's just the very tippy tippy top of the iceberg on this whole thing. In the late 1930s, it came out during a U.S. government lawsuit that General Electric 
had purposefully shortened the life of its flashlight bulbs, making it so that they only lasted through two batteries instead of three. And a memorandum showed that a company engineer was outlining a new idea to adjust it down so that they would only last for one battery. Quote, if this is done, we estimate it will result in increasing our flashlight business 60%, he wrote. Gee, you think? In 1957, Home Furnishings Daily Journal reported that companies were watering down their products in all sorts of ways, from using cheaper materials outright, like thinner plastics, to just straight up reducing product sizes and not really widely letting people know that that's what was being done. And the journal concluded that in some cases, the high end of the line or highest price model of certain appliances ended up being no better quality wise than the low end of appliances had been a few years earlier by comparison. Some of these products Packard notes could have actually been made better at little to no expense to the company at all. So to upgrade the products to make them last longer would have cost nothing, but they simply just didn't want to because then people wouldn't buy as much. Some corporations did get caught designing purposefully crappy products, while others just openly and even proudly admitted that that's exactly what they were doing. An engineer at a prominent portable radio manufacturer defended his company's decision to design a radio that would not last more than three years. Instead of the 10 years, he admitted they could have built a radio to last for and it was explained that this was good because according to this engineer, they needed more frequent repeat sales to get more cash more often in order for the company to develop better radios. So the customer paying three times as much as they would have, buying more radios than they would have, something referred to in here as force feeding the consumer, which just sounds gross, was good because it contributed to progress. Although, It was really never made clear how any of that actually worked, considering the progress seemed to just be getting people to buy three times more radios at three times the cost. Not sure where the progress part actually was in terms of the radio itself. And when it was admitted to in this time period, obsolescence was touted as a contribution to society that was making everything better. In 1956, electrical manufacturing stated, the hard logic of our national economy would support the need for a broad policy of planned obsolescence in order to take the maximum advantage of our potential for productivity and technological progress. Basically advertising the purposeful design of products for a, quote, reasonably short lifespan. (laughs) Retailing Daily asserted, it is not only our privilege to obsolete the minimum home and many home furnishings, it is our obligation. We are obligated to work on obsolescence as our contribution to a healthy, growing society. Who is this on the ground? Why, it's... Extortion consumerism. He's a master at disguises and wanted in seven states. That explains a lot. Which on its face is like making a semantics argument that the growth of debt, the growth of landfills, and the growth of cancerous tumors are all somehow healthy. Well, it's growing, right? It's growing, so that must be good. (laughs) Not so many years ago, the automobile was considered a luxury. About the only time it received an airing was on Sunday or a holiday. I just want to talk for a couple minutes on cars again because what was done with cars in this time period was particularly insane especially in terms of resources and the environment and and cars have a very special place in the post-war period of planned obsolescence as virtually everything about cars began to get worse in the 1950s and by purposeful design the number of cars on our city streets offers proof that for millions of people Automotive transportation is almost as much a necessity as a house. And Packard, in his book, devotes multiple chapters to this, just to cars, because of how crazy it was. 
again, that could that could be its own hour just talking about what they did here. But I'm just going to try and sum a few things up so you get the idea. Advertising journal Tide reported that gas mileage dropped from 20 miles a gallon to 15 miles a gallon in the first eight years of the 50s. Popular science concluded that gas mileage had sagged down 14% below the 20 year average by 1958. The average motorist was buying 100 more gallons of gas per year. And for a number of years, Packard reports the American Petroleum Institute was urging motorists to throw away their dirty old sludge oil and put new motor oil in every 1,000 miles. Can you imagine getting your oil changed every 1,000 miles? That's what they were telling people they had to do. Multiple sources were reporting a sharp downward trend also on tire tread mileage in the 50s as well. And the Wall Street Journal reported in 1959 that not only were tires wearing out faster these days inexplicably, but, quote, auto companies maintain a stony silence when questioned about complaints of declining tire mileage. And they weren't just, it wasn't just parts of the car that they were trying to sell more of and replacements for that didn't need it and, and things wearing out faster, but they were actually designing the cars themselves to age faster in general, like the body of the car. What's new? Everything. New show car styling. They were adding a lot more things made out of chrome that would rust. They were adding stylistic choices that would start to look out of date quicker. Each bright new model features show car styling all its own with a whole new design. And by 1960, they had the average American trading in their old car just over every two years. A consumer bulletin concluded, there seems to be no doubt that bodies of present day cars would be made to last much longer than they do now, but manufacturers are fully aware that if they make their cars too durable, future sales will suffer. Hip to this game coming out of Detroit, foreign car makers started promoting their cars by saying they don't change the car's style, just make it work better. A Volkswagen is never changed to make it look different only to make it work better. Economists were also scaring Americans that if they bought the cheaper foreign compact cars instead of these massive boats coming out of Detroit in the 50s, the nation's roads might suffer because better gas mileage would mean less overall revenues on taxes. And they were also expressing concern for the steel industry. If compact cars took over, they, they took half a ton less steel to build per car and it might hurt the steel industry. This is the way they were doing it. The average American remained vaguely discontent. There was something missing. John. Yes, Murray. John, what's happening to us? I think we both know, Murray. It's just that... We seem to be drifting apart. I have tried. Oh, I don't blame you, John. It's just that... It's not your fault either, of course. It's just that, that we don't have... Exactly. There's this awful gap in our lives. It's just that... With all our technology and industrial know-how, we still don't have the one thing that could give us a better way of life. They say it can't be done. That it's just an impossible dream but in the laboratories of your name here dedicated scientists face the challenge the fourth tenet of obsolescence is making stuff that seems like it sucks so surely you've heard the idiom keeping up with the joneses well by 1956 forbes was reporting this kind of rivalry would be exploited Obviously, psychologically, there's no other way to do that. Oh, no, I couldn't. I, I'd have to make things easy for them. It might do him a world of good to be left all alone with Jimmy for two or three days. In your kitchen. In your kitchen. by home appliance makers in an upcoming campaign to convince Americans they should replace refrigerators, ranges, and washing machines every year or two. By the way, did you know that this kitchen won an award from the Woman's Home Companion? Huh? And Frigidaire, which at the time was a division of General Motors, just by the way, 
openly announced its new sales campaign with the slogan, Planned Product Obsolescence. New fashioned products which are bound to make old fashioned everything that has gone before. Styling, exciting to behold. A spine tingling new concept. So this was even in the paper. The head of Frigidaire and a General Motors vice president out of Dayton, Ohio confirmed, we have committed ourselves to a program of planned product obsolescence. Translation, the company intends to introduce new styles and features every year to make owners of even late model appliances dissatisfied with what they have and eager to buy the newest ones available. things look as well as the way they perform. Our homes acquire new grace, new glamour, new accommodations, expressing not only the American love of beauty, but also the basic freedom of the American people, which is the freedom of individual choice. So the, the plan was to once again make housewives feel like crap and think their kitchen sucked after just a year or two and that they needed all new appliances, all new stuff. I wish... I just wish I had a decent kitchen. Wash, rinse, repeat. And other companies jumped in on this trend of making people conscious of their stuff looking old or being old in style so they'd want new stuff. And people were. A lot of this obsolescence was psychological. Women want and demand kitchen products radiantly alive with color. In the form of companies weaponizing style to destroy the desirability and thus the value of something by creating an obsolescence of the mind Packard refers to. In other places, it's referred to as psychological obsolescence. In Bernaysian-like fashion, they worked really hard to make last year's style seem really uncool on purpose, so you'd want to buy the new thing. But I'm sure they're talking about a favorite subject, fashions, and the newest creations they are wearing from right here in California. Our designers have developed a sophisticated flavor to this black and white check pinafore. The neckline and the back treatment are appealing and fashionable. The bouffant puff sleeves are lined to retain their shape. And look at the pattern of racing colors in this shaggy dog cotton twill clam digger. Ruffles are a sure sign of this summer's fashion. They're everywhere. I mean, if you've ever wondered why each successive decade of the 20th century has a very distinct look, yeah, pretty sure this is a massive part of it. Market researcher Lewis Cheskin is quoted in here as saying, most design changes are made not for improving the product, either aesthetically or functionally, but for making it obsolete. Leading dress designers think the bigger, the bolder, the wilder the print, the more artistic the dress. Or is it just another fashion fad? This is not just the fashion industry either, but all industries trying to emulate the fashion industry doing this. Everything was about being judged on appearances, too. This is an ad I just randomly came across for suits in a 1954 newspaper, and it says, your station in life is judged not only by your home, but also by your appearance. Judy, is it about time you got dressed here? I'm dressed. Well, that's a matter of opinion. Go put on a dress before they get here. Ask for him? Okay. Just in case the denizens of the 50s weren't entirely sure, it was spelled out for them right in the ad, okay? And people not only really believe this corpo creation linking self-esteem to products, but they still do even today. People still believe this. People are paying $300 for these weird ass Yeezy shoes that look like Crocs on crack. I, I mean, somebody I assume is. I don't know. I mean, Kanye was selling a $120 plain white t-shirt, too. And that, that sold out. People were like, I'm going to give me a $120 white t-shirt. <laughs> anyway, I guess that's really cool. I don't, I don't know. Um. Mmm, a new neighbor. He looks promising. Nice car. But uh-oh, here's where 
her good neighbor policy ends. Poor guy. So people are still believing this, though. That's the point. I, I got judged. I got judged a few weeks ago by an elderly real estate agent on the fact that I have a ripped up couch in my living room that a cat destroyed a couple years ago that I haven't replaced because it's still mostly functional. And I, I just don't have money to throw at things like furniture right now. The cost of which I feel at this point is incredibly inflated and ridiculous. So I started sewing patches on it. Guess how much I care. So the 50s was a time of there being only three television stations. And I would say a lot more trust in what was being shown on those stations then than now. But people still believe a lot of what they're told now. So your product here, live in a more comfortable home. Take off ugly fat. Keep romance from fading away. Your product here. But there are a lot of commercials from that time period that are just straight preying on people's fear and insecurity, and that was just a norm for selling things. The following demonstration shows how important this is to you. Coffee companies, for example, were making wives feel like their husbands would cheat on them with the secretary if the coffee didn't taste good enough. Your coffee, sir. Thanks, beautiful. You're welcome. How can such a pretty wife make such bad coffee? I heard that. Must have been such a nice vacation. <laughs> Did you ever see Larry looking so happy? Oh, honey, happiness is a vacation. <laughs> Away from your coffee. Oh, no. What's wrong? Oh, it's your coffee again. Well, it's your coffee. Mm -mm. <gasps> this coffee is criminal. Honey, you killed the petunias. Then you admit it. Your coffee really is murder. Want anything special for your birthday? Just a decent cup of coffee. You're kidding. I'm serious. Honey, your coffee's undrinkable. That's pretty harsh. Well, so's your coffee. You know, the girls down at the office make better coffee on their hot plates. Well, see you later. And he didn't even kiss me goodbye. Hey, great coffee. It's instant Folgers. Doesn't it taste good as fresh perked? Better. Better than those girls make at the office. Honey, their coffee can't hold a candle to yours. What does coffee have to do with not getting cheated on? I'm not really sure. But that's the way it was portrayed. Did it sell coffee? I bet it did. I found a Goodyear tire commercial that I just, I want to play this for you. Hold on. This flat tire needs a man. But when there's no man around... should be why kind of makes it seem like if you're a woman and you get a flat tire and there's not a man around to help you bad things might happen to you i mean they even call the freaking thing lifeguard like the tire itself is protecting your life not necessarily from flat tires or a possible blowout and car crash or anything but but what might happen to you as a woman who gets a flat tire and has to like go out for help by yourself in high heels at night without a man around and there are so many examples like this. I could probably go on all day with that, but you get the point. And she spends money. In any case, our consumer is a real person. Just for reference, I was watching Alan Renee's uh, My American Uncle French film, and he's done a really sophisticated montage technique of inter interweaving people's stories, like multiple characters, hard to keep track of them all. And they're retailing their childhood, how they were raised, how their parents were, who they fell in love with, and what they decided to do. And like, it's interesting. But anyway, they merged it with a scientist guy talking about the theory of the brain. So there's uh, three different levels of the brain. And the lowest level of the brain, the, the oldest one from an evolutionary standpoint is known as the reptilian brain. It's associated with your most basic needs. You know, everybody's got to eat. There's got to be sleep and rest. Um, there's reproduction. And then there's fight or flight. The basic things, the kind of animalistic drives. But there's an interplay, like we never quite leave behind 
the basic drives, we continue as humans, no matter how sophisticated, educated, conscious, developed we get, we still deal with hunger, uh, sex, food, sleep, and, and those type of things on a daily basis, uh, on a continuing basis. Anyway, it's kind of a long story, but the play between that is very interesting. But he says, in terms of consciousness and memory, what makes up a brain, what makes up an individual's human experience is others. It's their experience with others. Uh, the traumatic moments, yes, but also all the little subtle details of falling in love and filling your memory banks with the first time, you know, you had that magical kiss and that sort of thing. Alan Rene as a director, I think is speaking to what cinema can do and that sort of thing. But meanwhile, we're dealing with television, consumer goods, post-war industries. And what they've really done is tied the most basic reptilian brain that Renee's character calls consumption. The consumption is all your basic needs. They've tied that to the higher levels of consciousness, the aspiration towards dreams and what if scenarios and appreciation for the higher. And they've merged them so that whereas a dream might drive you, might drive your behavior, inspire you to do things to accomplish goals, they've tied them to the most basic needs, even though they're easily accomplished, so you can never have enough of the most basic needs. This episode is about Freud's American nephew, Edward Bernays. He showed American corporations for the first time how they could make people want things they didn't need by linking mass-produced goods to their unconscious desires. I wish I had a castle in the sky. They cause people to feel like they never quite have enough and they always need more and they've tied their dreams. You've got women in the 50s dancing around washing machines and in their finest dress in a dream state in that car with the person they might love driving on that hilltop. And sure, those are nice moments in reality when they happen. I wish my living room were all redone. New drapes, new rugs, all oh, this is fun. You know, dancing around your washing machine. They settled the land. And they built great cities, monuments to their progress. Yet for all their vast achievements, something of their dream still eluded them. But really the dream represents something you can never quite fulfill. Even if you get that model, even if you get that washing machine, that car, that dress, even that man, this form of consumption tied to the dreams, exploited in advertising, makes people always feel like they have to have more consumption, a lacking sense of consumption, even when the basic needs are met. There's nothing inherently exciting about washing clothes. For about 6,000 years now, give or take a couple, we've faced the problem of covering our bodies with clothing. Even with the newest and most sophisticated, latest washing machine model. And yet, having a woman dancing around a washing machine or a television set, they're tying the idea of dreams of fulfillment, the idea of what you could be to the basic things that you need so that you're always wanting to consume more. The old one is never good enough for very long. Earlier in the show, you saw the beginning of a trial of free center post agitator automatic washers and the new Westinghouse revolving agitator washer. Uh, we're not talking about just replacing broken and worn out things. We're talking about replacing them on the basis of desire. And Edward Bernays and his counterparts in the 20th century did this very consciously. They played upon Freud. Edward Bernays uh, is a nephew of Freud. And they played upon the emerging psychology and exploited it. They exploited the inherent needs of humans and tied them to their dreams to sell an infinite number of goods and meanwhile leave the bulk of the population continually, perpetually, forever feeling unfulfilled, never having enough, and always being a ready customer for whatever market is next, 
always a better model, right? It's not about literally filling your belly or literally having a place to sleep. It's about keeping up with the standard of that. And very consciously, Edward Bernays and everyone else in his field in the 20th century very consciously played upon this interaction and made people feel a lack, made people feel like they never had enough even when they did, you know, accomplishing basic needs for almost everyone in the world wouldn't be that hard except for the way they play upon economics. And really they're just pushing people to consume in a measure with their dreams, which is pretty much inappropriate. Improved styling constantly adds to the ease and grace and gaiety of American living. The things we have in America are ever changing. The studios and workshops of our stylists pour forth a never ending flow of service and of artistry. Now let's see if our mystery ghost diver is really weaponizing style to make things suck so you'll buy more. Well, I sure had everything figured out. It's one thing for engineers and corporations to give products death dates, to purposefully time things to last for only a short time, to break, to need more frequent maintenance and replacement, you bastards. But it's a whole other level for the advertisers to manipulate the consumers into getting their own brains to lie to them, to make them no longer satisfied by the physical thing, even though it's still perfectly good because their desires and their dreams and really their underlying need to recreate some primordial moment of fulfillment on any type of need, any level, any type of consumer good. They're getting people's brains to tell them to no longer be satisfied or fulfilled by things that are perfectly good physically so that when the next style comes around, they will only semi-consciously, mostly subconsciously, they will want to buy it. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this commercial is going to use subliminal, subliminal, subliminal advertising. And in some cases, they'll do whatever it takes at almost any cost to get the next best sneakers or get the thing that will please their wife and maybe patch up a bad marriage. If Bob truly loved me, he'd give me gas for Christmas. <laughs> I laugh at my own jokes. It's so lame. And so forth and so on. That inner child may be trying to recreate that illusory feeling of safety and happiness, having mommy put him or her in that playpen when they were still just tiny, but only for a fleeting moment in time when happiness seemed tangible, even though it's always been elusive. Now's the time for you to buy the General Electric Blender. Oh, what a dreamy ride. The whole thing is sophisticated by playing upon what is primordial and basic. And in that sense, it's psychology that is weaponized against us to turn us into consumers, repeating base consumers who can never quite get out of the pit, out of the lower level of trying just to fulfill their basic needs so they can never really focus on where we are, or what we're trying to do, or what our purpose is. It's sophisticated. It's weaponized. That invention is worth a fortune. Well, I sure had everything figured out. If we're trapped, as it were, in the consumer mode, always needing the next thing to achieve basic fulfillments of inherent needs, pleasure, escaping pain, maybe not even an actual reality, but just as a psychological suggestion that's been placed there. Now, where does that leave our potential to reach the higher states of human consciousness?
it's really easy for people today to look at this and look back at that time and say, wow, what a bunch of schmucks who are totally being manipulated. In 2021, the average person is estimated to encounter 6,000 to 10,000 advertisements every single day. This is double the number of advertisements we'd have seen in 2007 and 12 times more than what people were seeing in the 70s. Sure, governments and corpos were pushing obsolescence and wanting consumerism and insecurity just to sell more crap and grow the economy, but certainly we'd be smarter today. Certainly we would catch on to any ridiculous financial schemes being deployed against us now. It'd be slick if we had an electric ironer, like Sally's mother has. Of course it would. And I'm looking forward to having an electric dryer, too. Sure do get a smooth shave with this electric razor. Where do you see the electric water heater, Dad, got it? Well, load it now. We have plenty of hot water all the time. Everything's so easy with an electric range. I, I was just thinking. Thinking? About what? Oh, you know. Thinking how awful wash day used to be for you before you had the electric water heater and the washer. Are we, though? Are we smarter today? Really? The modern world is a world in which business plays an important part. You know, back then, these people thought they were the height of, of science and technological progress. They thought they were the height of intelligence, too. The refrigerator keeps day-to-day -day food in perfect freshness. The dishwasher... Now there's a machine that does away with a chore that everybody hates. And the dishwasher uses such hot water you couldn't possibly put your hands in it. Sure, that makes the dishes hygienically clean. My, you certainly know all about dishwashers. Why don't you let me fix you some of this new Mococo drink? All natural cocoa beans from the upper slopes of Mount Nicaragua, no artificial sweeteners. What the hell are you talking about? So in the past, people were taught to accept planned obsolescence and be good consumers and grow the economy for technological progress. No matter how enormous the industrial capacity of a nation may be, from its harnessing of hydroelectric power, its steel production, its number of machine tools, the size of its labor forces, on into the skill of its scientific research, only if the greatest part of this industrial output is in consumer goods designed for, priced for, and made available to all the people of every community, does it contribute anything to a higher standard of living. And there is no one factor more representative of or more conducive to the economic well-being of the American citizen than the home in which he lives. If everybody's raising living standards to the point where everybody's got a car and everybody's got air conditioning and everybody's got a big house, uh, well, the planet will boil over. Today, we're living in a world where we're being told significant behavioral changes must once again happen in regard to the things we eat, the things we buy, our travel, how we spend our time, coming from all over the corporate, political, and NGO world. I mean, we get new recommendations for how to fix the problems caused in the 20th century by corporations all the time now. And most of them are on the individual. Here's one such thing. I just want to show you this because I thought this was particularly special. This is called C40, which describes itself as a climate leadership group of 96 cities around the world representing a twelfth of the world's population and a quarter of the global economy, and describes itself as a global network of mayors of the world's leading cities that are united in action to confront the climate crisis. And they released this report, which they referred to as a pioneering piece of thought leadership titled, The Future of Urban Consumption. So this came out back in the summer of 2019, and it called for individual consumption reduction targets to lower emissions and mitigate the crisis. And they broke it down into six categories, which include reducing the number of new clothing items bought per person each year, shifting to a plant-based diet, drastically lowering or cutting out altogether meat and dairy consumption, reducing the number of flights each person takes, reducing car ownership, and then increasing car lifespans and material efficiency. But the reduction of car ownership is first. Increasing car lifespans and material efficiency is, is listed after that. Improving materials efficiency in the utilization of buildings, 
and optimizing the life of IT equipment. Some of these are merely problematic, but others of these are either impossible or just completely out of an individual's control altogether. And before I show you these targets, which they claim need to be met by the end of the present decade, by 2030 in these major cities, I want to point out this report openly states that they realize individual consumers cannot change the way the global economy operates. So at least they pretend to know that, right? But it does go on to say that many of the interventions they're proposing rely on individual action. Why? Why is that? Why is it individual action and not corporate action? After all, it's not up to individuals how a car company decides to engineer the lifespans of the cars, or how efficient a tech company decides to make its products, or when it decides to roll out new products and obsolete the old ones. Right? Those processes are all completely out of customer hands altogether. And just like everything, I think it's very interesting when you look at the C40, where is this at? C40, influencing the global agenda. I think it's interesting when you look at these kinds of things and you look at who's funding it. Because yes, it's things like Bloomberg and things like the German government and the UK government and Denmark and stuff like that. But you get down in here and you got lots of corporations that are on board with this and foundations that are part of corporations and the Open Society Foundation, IKEA, L'Oreal, the Hewlett Foundation, FedEx and Google and partnerships with the Clinton Foundation. It's all the same. It's always all the same, right? So you have companies <laughs> getting on board with this and they're going to tell you it's not their problem, it's yours. You individually need to fix some things. You need to make all these adjustments in your own life. Isn't it funny how when corporations get together, they decide it's all on us to change and fix everything. Not them, not the way they do business, not what they're doing at all. So that's that's cool, I guess. And this report shows that there are two levels to these targets for consumption by 2030. They've got progressive targets and ambitious targets. It says the specific consumption interventions and targets have been developed through a dual process of desk research and engagement with subject matter specialists to validate assumptions. Isn't that nice? They got the subject matter specialists just hanging out, just ready to validate assumptions. Good, good. Beautiful. The ambitious targets for 2030 are no meat or dairy consumed by anyone. Then another steak that's certainly nice for family meals or when you're entertaining because it's a nice large size steak is this one, a flat bone sirloin. Now another steak that's delicious for broiling or for cooking outdoors is a beef ribeye steak. Now for economy, you might like to try a blade chuck steak. Earlier this year, the United Nations held a global conference on the benefits of eating insects, even suggesting it might be a good solution to world hunger. Here's a booklet entitled How to Buy Beef Steaks. I don't know why the United States doesn't eat insects when they're actually very healthy for you. Only three new clothing items per person per year. Down through the ages, women have paid meticulous attention to the matter of dressing. One short haul return flight every three years per person. Jet speeds will help to accomplish one of man's long sought goals an easy interchange of peoples throughout the world. Transoceanic flights now become short hops. Six and a half magic hours to Europe. And nobody owns a personal vehicle at all. Even just the progressive target on cars would have less than 20% of the population owning a personal vehicle. Let me get that down. Which I live in Texas, and I just think is so weird, okay? Because Austin, Texas is one of these C40 cities that's on this list. And I'm telling you, the public transportation in Austin is like a weird afterthought they just slapped in at some point because they had to. And we're just trying to get across town today here in Austin, Texas. And we've probably been in the car for what, an hour? Yep. Just trying to get from one side of town to the other side of town. It's building everything up and up and up and condensing everything in and in and in so that people will stay where they're at 
and just walk around their general small area. They just put more and more stuff everywhere, more and more stores, more and more restaurants, more and more businesses. There's just all this stuff everywhere so that you'll just stay up in your giant tower there and hardly ever leave to go anywhere. And if you do, you'll be walking or riding a bike. You definitely won't be driving. They're completely dissuading people from having cars at all. They're trying to push new initiatives here in town where they're dissuading people from even parking downtown at all and just trying to get people to not even ha have a car basically i don't think it's going to be completely phased out but they're going to make it very expensive so only rich people can do it but uh they're doing it all across the country if you look at america2050.org the rockefeller, Which is the rockefeller foundation. foundation we tried to get home from the airport in austin using public transport a few years back just so we could compare it to western europe's system and it took us four hours walking around with our luggage, hopping on multiple different bus lines, just so that we could get stranded in the middle of town because the train stopped running at like 7.30 p.m. on a weekday. The bus didn't go north far enough to help us. So it's kind of a joke to put this off on the average person who really doesn't have any choice in the matter if they need to get around for work and to live. All the major cities and metropolitan zones are putting twice as many people in all of them by that target year 2050. And so they're moving everyone in from suburban and rural areas. I don't think we're gonna ever make it across town today. I don't even know why we tried to go anywhere. And that's the whole point. I don't think they want anybody to really go anywhere. But they are. To the point that it looks like the same graphic design artists who came up with the XR color scheme and design schema have come up with what is being called the take the jump pledge, where they're trying to get people to pledge to do the things that were listed here. And they even promoted it in the mainstream media as well as six promises you can make to help reduce carbon emissions. So you can take one short haul flight every three years per person, right? But these same people who represent these different foundations and corporations that are funding the C40 cities, they're gonna take one private jet flight every year to WEF so they can lecture us all about what we need to do to fix the environment. <laughs> how to sleep, how to get up in the morning, how to brush your hair, how to eat, how to dress, how to communicate, how to have manners, how to play, how to make good habits, how to be well-groomed, how to wash your hands, how to be a good student, how to be healthy, how to control your emotions, how to be popular, how to be a citizen, how to be productive, how to be professional, how to prepare, how to date, how to be ready for marriage, how to be a parent, how to act your age, how to grow old, how to live, how to die, how to live, how to die, how to live, how to die, how to live, how to die. Corpos, meanwhile, keep on incorporating. But the point I guess I'm trying to make by showing you all this is that generations past were literally trained by a combination of psychological tactics and modern advertising that they wouldn't have a fulfilled life or be good enough or whole without buying a bunch of stuff all the time. Your product here enables or helps him to enjoy healthful recreation. Have well-trained, obedient pets. Make friends. Have leisure time for travel. Grow bigger crops. Get real smoking satisfaction. Enjoy smoother shaves. Strengthen our national defense. Modern humans trained for generations to look at what they have but only see what they lack. That to be alive in modern society is to lack and to need stuff. By satisfying people's inner selfish desires, one made them happy and thus docile. It was the start of the all-consuming self which has come to dominate our world today. A mindset that puts us in a position of not being whole without corporations to give us the things that we need to be whole. Thanks to your name here, employment boom. 
not only in the vast modern facilities of your name here, but in factories everywhere, geared to supply this vital new industry that is reshaping our economy and transforming the lives of millions. People did as they were told. So many that were now living in the actual fallout of that. With new, your product here, available to all, man is working modern miracles, breaking the boundaries of time, nearing the conquest of space itself. In countless ways, directly and indirectly, your product here serves the nation and its citizens plays a vital role in helping every American to achieve a better way of life. Where fulfillment was once driven into physical consumption, now companies are driving into digital consumption, but it's not really, it's not much different. <laughs> Today, the same system that baked obsolescence into our lives back then is telling us that we are now going obsolete. There's too many of us, we're a drag on resources, at the same moment they claim to be cracking the code to immortality, they're saying the average person should only live to the age of 75, while we have billionaires openly bragging that they'll be living more than twice as long. Like Sean Parker over here. But here's what Parker said. Quote, Because I'm a billionaire, I'm going to have access to better health care, so I'm going to be like 160, and I'm going to be part of this, like, class of immortal overlords. If you were going to put a sentence in as, as an example of what arrogance is, this is perfect right here. This, this should be in there under arrogance because this is the most arrogant thing I've ever heard a person say with a straight face in front of other people. So that's what the real wealth gap is. It's not the superficial wealth. It's the ultimate logical conclusion of that wealth in relation to the steering of scientific research and technological progress and the fact that by having so much money, people like Parker, who by the way at age 38 just so happens to be the founder and chair of the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy, I just can't imagine why, uh, these people are saying that through technology they will be able to live twice as long as everyone else, twice as long as the average pleb, referring to himself as joining a class of immortal overlords. I mean, just... <laughs> that the very behaviors bred into generations of us by corpos are the problem that needs to change. Not the way corporations do business, which is so obvious that even the World Economic Forum admits they're incentivized not to design anything for longevity. So all these businesses got together and they decided they'd rather do a subscription model economy of usership and constant never-ending debt that will cost the average person more money for the same stuff instead of just making stuff that doesn't break and wind up in a landfill and require replacing as often in the first place. And they've shifted a lot of the blame and a lot of the burden for change on the individual, which is, at the same time, handily shifting it away from the corporations. Could it be because they, oh, I don't know, represent corporations, these people that go to this? I mean, ding, ding, ding. It's a shocking concept, I know. Presenting King Ding. Mighty ruler of the dingling world. What's this little guy doing? He's in King Ding's elevator and is riding up through the inner power plant. Now he's getting close to the head. He's there. He becomes King Ding's actual brain. And a $3 million TV campaign will introduce the world of the dingalings for what it is. It's barely discussed how the economic model of planned obsolescence that's been in place for decades and was literally taught to generation after generation is still to this day contributing to resource exploitation in the name of profits over not just people, but freaking everything, okay? No, no, it's just, it's blamed on individuals though. It's just individuals and population. It's anywhere but corporations. Just don't look there, all right? Sure, walk into any Walmart and right up front, you're instantly going to be looking at so much cheap, non-biodegradable, earth-hating plastic, your head will spin. But hey, they have sustainability summits and stuff, okay? So, you know. Who is that? This? 
this is the end of the mystery. Well, well, if it isn't our old friend... Before I get too far off on a side tangent, this green future, I mean, let's let's go ahead for the sake of a fun party game and we'll just assume that everything we're being told can be taken at face value. Well, the purpose of a party is to have fun together. Which is a big if. Uh, like the hugest if, probably, that's possible. Right now about the transition that we're being told has to happen to save the planet, okay? The World Bank is claiming that the mining of minerals Something which has traditionally been a nightmare for the environment and all the living things in it is going to have to increase by a whopping 500% by 2050 just to meet the growing demand for clean energy technologies. So, in other words, in the most basic of senses, we have to trust the same corpos whose prime directive is to make money for their shareholders first and foremost. The same corpos being fined millions of dollars even now for what could essentially be called obsolescence practices or straight up lying about greenwashing, which they've been caught doing. Even now, as they claim out of one side of their mouth, they're going to go green and be all sustainable and stuff like that. We have to trust them to also be good stewards of the earth as we increase the mining of rare earth minerals and other minerals 500%. And that's going to be good for the earth now. <laughs> You did it again. I mean, I'm sorry, but isn't that kind of schizo just on its face? Baby oil, for example. It is so pure and mild that during the infant period, it is often used instead of water for his back. Who would think that from this crude oil, pure baby oil is refined? Why do I even have to ask that? Why do I, why do I even have to say that? It just sounds stupid coming out of my mouth. And while... People are kept busy fighting amongst themselves. The people going to these WEF meetings, they might personally hate each other's guts for all I know, but they're all organizing together just fine, just coming together for their agenda, and they're not having a problem with that. And if anything proves that, it is how coordinated the last three years and the resultant wealth transfer to the top appeared to be. So, Average people are getting poorer and sicker, and they're fighting amongst themselves about political carpet sides and culture wars and whatever else. But meanwhile, all these corporate representatives over here are flying private jets around lecturing everyone else on the environment, which got purposefully trashed in the 20th century by lying, devious corporations, okay? That is who did it. Not the person buying stuff who didn't realize they were being tricked into buying crap that was falling apart and made on purpose to go fill up a landfill somewhere. Corporations that made those decisions on purpose to extract as much money from people as possible. Okay? At all costs. Not giving two shits about the environment whatsoever. And now, corporate talking heads are coming together for global agendas that are being implemented top-down all over the world and they're saying, hey, the burden is on the individual to change, not the corporations, not them, you. And back then, people thought keeping up with the Joneses and all the consumerism that came with it was somehow their own personal idea that they organically had themselves. That these ideas of what they needed to eat and buy and wear and what products they needed to live a good life came from their own brain and certainly weren't being put there by aggressive marketing campaigns drenched in weaponized psychology to get desired behavioral and financial results, right? No, no. But certainly today, the people that are walking around parroting these talking points about how many people there are and how overpopulated everything is and, and here's what we need to eat and buy and wear and what products we need to live a good life and, and do better, that's their own personal ideas, right? That they're organically having themselves right now because those are entirely good for society and progress and totally aren't being put there once again by the very entities that stand to benefit from them. Just like people in the 50s were made to believe that obsolescence was not only acceptable but entirely good for society and progress too by the very entities that stood to benefit from them. Gee, if only hypocrisy balanced the equation. 
the living symbol of our national heritage. A story in the great tradition of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and the other heroic figures who, like your company president here, dedicated their lives to humanity and whose contributions to the betterment of mankind will never be forgotten. I truly am starting to think that people just have no idea where they are right now. And now, a letter to the New World Order. Dear Adult Diaper Corpos, how are you? I'm sure the adult diaper biz is, as they say, booming. Well, I had a dream it was sagging. So your new team of TikTok literate, cool adjacent adults from the gen below mine concocted a brilliant plan that is so... Gen Z. Phrase. Here. It might even wake Sigmund Freud's nephew Edward Bernays long ago rotting corpse from the dead just to get paid a few more sweet, sweet consultant dollars to approve it. It had to do with paying a handful of low-level TikTok influencers to make it seem trendy and like it was totally their own idea not hatched in a corporate boardroom to take pictures and video of themselves wearing your product here, adult diapers to a Taylor Swift concert, and posting them on TikTok with lines like, It's the most durable, the most absorbent, said the shameless groupie with a giggle, <laughs> describing the top quality of her adult diapers, which are typically reserved for folks living with incontinence, immobility, dementia, or severe diarrhea. <laughs> I know it was just a dream, but your company here and its new generation of PR minions concocting ways to spend marketing dollars to get younger and younger gens to wear diapers until everyone at every age has a reason to buy diapers and wear diapers cradle to grave still really freaks me right the hell out. Sincerely, me. 